Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 4 say this, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou, and when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. And what I'm going to speak on today is the fact that Father's Day is coming up. We need to evaluate how to identify someone who's a biblical husband and a biblical father. So the subject I'm going to speak on today is how to identify a real biblical man. If you're a young lady and you're a Christian and you are waiting for to be married, you want a husband. These are some ways in which you can identify who's a real biblical man that is ready to marry you. And if you are a young Christian man and you're growing into your manhood, these are some steps that you can take to become a real biblical man. Now I'm gonna go through seven steps here and this list is not meant to be all inclusive, but it's just meant to give you the general idea to give you a strong foundation of if you're a young woman, how you can identify a man who's gonna be a good Christian husband. And if you're a young man, how you can become a real biblical man, a real biblical husband. So the first thing is if you look here, God is giving marriage advice unto the Israelites and he is warning them against marrying these Canaanite groups mentioned here. Now, you have a lot of cults who will twist this and say that this is a passage that promotes racial purity, and they will then use this as an argument to try to explain why they don't want black people and white people to get married or you know Asians and, and Latinos or whatever. They'll try to say that everyone needs to stay separate and stay with their own kind. But according to the Bible, this has got nothing to do with racial purity. This has everything to do with spiritual purity because in verse four, God gives the reason why you shouldn't intermingle with them. It says in verse four, for they will turn away thy son from following me that they may serve other gods. And so these Canaanite groups listed here that God told the Israelites not to marry, the reason was because they were serving other gods and they were going to infect the spiritual culture of the Israelites. They were gonna cause them to stop believing in the real God and shift them towards other gods. And so the first thing we can do to identify a real biblical man from seeing all this, is he saved? If he is not saved, then he is not a real biblical man. He is not eligible for marriage if you're a young lady considering him. And if you're a young man, this is good advice to get saved because a mixed marriage between a believer and an unbeliever, as the Bible says here, brings the wrath of God. That's why at the end of verse four, it says, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. So you have a lot of Christians who will say, well, maybe if he's not a believer, maybe if I love him enough and I'm kind enough and I'm gentle enough to him, I can, you know, if I marry him, we'll work out that faith detail later. I can just coax him into being a good man. But what does the Bible say? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans chapter 10. Faith is not gonna come by getting a nice Christian wife who's going to be soft and soothing to you. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And so if you are a woman and you are considering marriage and he's not even saved, just keep looking. Even in the New Testament, it teaches this in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, where it says, be not unequally yoked together believers with unbelievers. Now, there are examples where the Bible teaches that if a woman, has an, if a woman gets saved, after she gets married, but her husband doesn't get saved yet, that with her godly character, she may be able to positively influence him and get him to a place where he's willing to listen to the gospel. But when it talks about single women, single Christian women are to stay away from unbelieving men, because as you can see here, marriages of mixed faith will cause the destruction, will cause the wrath of God. You even see this taught in Genesis chapter six, Genesis 6 is arguably one of the first times in the Bible 
where mixed marriages between believers and unbelievers happen. And that caused so much violence to be upon the earth that God sent the flood and had to destroy most of the human population except for Noah and his family. Because in Genesis chapter six, it talks about the sons of God marrying the daughters of men. Now, some try to argue, some cults will argue that the sons of God in Genesis chapter six is talking about angels who were marrying human beings. But that's a ridiculous argument because the Bible tells you what a son of God is. And in John chapter one, it says, as many as believed on him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. And so a son of God used consistently throughout the Bible, if we let scripture interpret scripture, a son of God is a believer. So in Genesis chapter six, you had mixed marriages between men who were believers and women who were not believers. And as a result of that mixed marriage, if you go down a few verses after that happens in Genesis 6, you see so much violence on the earth that God sends the flood. But this is just a picture of the kind of damage you can do to your future generations if the man that you marry is not a believer, because he will set a poor example for your children, and they may not come into the faith, and they will set a poor example for their children, and so on and so forth. And so, ladies, I don't care how good he looks, if he doesn't believe the gospel, you need to keep you need to keep going and just move on and allow God to bring a man who actually does believe your way. And young men, if you don't believe, then you would not be a suitable husband for a young Christian woman because you don't even have the first foundation. Second Corinthians six fourteen, Deuteronomy seven one through four of being a believer. So that is step one that he's a believer. Now step number two is found in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 when it talks about the responsibilities of husbands ephesians 6 4 says and ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the lord and so what we see here is that the father's responsibility is to bring up his children in the nurture and admonition of the lord in order to do that, he has to know what the nurture and admonition of the Lord is himself. He has to be saved and he has to know his Bible. And so that's step two. Step one is that he's saved. Step two, he knows his Bible. And not like that cute little commentary thing that people call the NIV or the New Living Translation. or No, the King James Version, which is the accurate Bible for the English-speaking person. He actually knows his Bible so that he can instruct his children in the ways of God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 35. It says, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for it, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So here in verse 35, it says, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands. What does that mean? Well, according to Ephesians 6, the father is responsible for teaching the children. But guess what? The husband is responsible for teaching the wife. You put it together. If a man is a husband and a father, he is responsible for teaching both his children and his wife the word of God. So he really needs to have read this whole thing to know it front and back, to be able to understand the word of God and what God expects of him so he can pass that legacy down to his children. You have a lot of men today who will say, well, teaching my kids and my wife is not my job. It's the youth pastor's job to teach my kids and it is the adult ministry pastor's job to teach my wife and I can just you know, sit on the couch and not have to do anything. But that's not biblical manhood. A real biblical man actually teaches his family the Bible himself, and he does not rely upon someone else to do it. Now, as you know, it's the pastor's job to set the example for what gets taught at home. That's why the Bible calls on pastors to feed the flock of God. But when it comes to the family unit itself, the father is responsible for teaching his wife and teaching his children the Bible. That's why it says in verse 35, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. And that's why you don't want to marry a man who does not know the Bible to where every time you want to 
know something about the Bible, you have to leave your home, go ask the pastor. And, you know, depending on what he asks you, that may contradict what your husband tells you because he hasn't read the Bible. In order to avoid that to begin with, you need to marry someone. If you're a young lady, marry a man who knows the Bible. And if you are a young man, you need to make sure you know the Bible because the spiritual well-being of your children and your wife as a man is your responsibility. You will be accountable before God of how well you raised your family and how well you took care of your wife spiritually. It is the husband's responsibility. And so that is step two. If he does not know his Bible, then you don't know what kind of heresy he might bring home or you don't know what kind of ways his lifestyle may lead your family astray. So if you're considering a husband, consider one who knows the Bible and not just any Bible, the real Bible for the English speaker, the King James Version. So that's step two. He, so he's saved and he knows his Bible. Step three, go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. And if you're a feminist listening to this, know that the Bible is not subject to the rules of feminism because this is God's universe, God's rules. It doesn't matter what you know, your feminist teacher or your feminist politician will say, this is what the word of God teaches. This is not some culture bound thing because God's word is timeless as per Psalm 100 verse five that says that God's truth endures to all generations. So that God's word is not gonna change just because we live in a feminist day and age. We need to conform to God's word, not the feminist word. First Timothy chapter five verse eight says this, but if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an uh, and is worse than an infidel. And so what we see here, what the Bible is teaching is that if any provide not for his own, this is talking specifically to men. And this is very important because what this is saying is that the man is the provider of the home. It says, if any provide not for his own, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And so what we need to understand there is that God calls for men to go out and pay the bills. God calls for men to be the ones to go out and get the job. Proverbs 31 is what calls for the woman to be a keeper of the home, as well as you see it even taught in the New Testament, is that God calls for young women to, be, to have a family, and God calls for men to be the providers. If you look at Titus chapter 2, if you look at Titus chapter 2, it describes what women are supposed to be doing. It says in Titus chapter 2, verse 3, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, nor given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, Verse five, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Notice how in verse five it says keepers at home. What this means is that it is the woman's job to raise the children, to instruct the children, to keep the home. It is the husband's job to go out and make the money because if the woman's keeping the home, well, who's going out and making the money? Simple logical deduction, the husband. And it says in verse in 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house. So clearly here, the Bible is saying that if a man in 1 Timothy 5, 8 does not provide for his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. He's worse than someone who's an unbeliever because he's pretending to be a believer, but in reality, he's not doing what God commands for his home. That's hypocrisy. And so what we need to understand here is that what the Bible is teaching is that young women are keepers of the home and their husbands are the providers. And so if you're trying to identify a real biblical man, if he's a provider, if he actually works, if he's actually moving towards a goal, he's ambitious, he's providing for his family, he brings home the bacon. If, if you see a man who actually is willing to work and provide for his family, that is a real biblical man. But if you see a lot of feminism has unfortunately neutered a lot of men in today's society to where I even work with some men who would say, well, I wish my wife would get a higher paying job 
so that I could just be a house husband, so that I could just stay at home and let her take care of the bill. That's lazy, and that is the opposite of what God teaches. And according to the Bible, that's what he compares to an infidel. And so feminism, where, men, where women are abandoning their family, they're dumping their kids off elsewhere in daycare or in all kinds of you know, different programs, they're you know, putting on the pants and going to get the job, and they're starting to be the breadwinner of the family and all that stuff. Well, first of all, from a sheer economical standpoint, now they're competing with men for those jobs. And now there are less men who are actually able to go out and get those jobs because women are competing with them for them. And second of all, um, that leaves very little room for the man to actually do his job. And third of all, the home does not get kept. You see, the woman has to go out to work. She comes home. She's too tired to cook dinner to actually be a keeper of the home. So she just gets a TV dinner. And then, you know, years down the road of eating that overly salty stuff or just going out because she's too tired to cook and clean, you see that now people have all sorts of health issues and weight issues because the mom was just too busy to actually take care of the family the way the Bible describes. Now, a lot of people say, that's so sexist. You're relegating women to servitude. You know, that's lowly. The Bible's really down on women if it tells them to keep the home, but that's not true. Look at the end of Proverbs 31. It says her children rise and call her blessed and her husband also. Give her the fruit of her work. Let her own works praise her in the gates. I mean, the Bible at the end of Proverbs 31 just tells the husband and the children to heap all kinds of praise upon the wife and mother when she's doing what she's supposed to be doing, which that goes to show if God is telling you to praise someone, then clearly that person is doing the good job and you should praise them. And so according to the Bible, the woman who is taking care of her family, who's taking care of the home, like Titus 2 says that she should do, she's worthy of praise. She's an honorable woman. And so all these people who look down on homemakers, look down on housewives, my wife stays at home and takes care of the kids while I go out and work. And, I, and that's how the Bible teaches. But you have all these feminists who will look down upon housewife. That's an ungodly anti-Christian spirit because the Bible says, let her own works praise her in the gates in the end of Proverbs 31. But if it's the, one, if it's the woman's job to be in the home and to take care of it and to take care of the children and instruct them, then clearly that means that it's the man's job to go out and pay the bills and be the breadwinner. And that is what the Bible teaches. And so ladies, if you're, if you're, if a young man is courting you and he's dating you and he starts talking about how he wants you to have a job and how if both of you work, then you could take care of him and all that stuff. That man is not looking for a wife because as a man, what the Bible teaches us as, as men, wives are what we take care of, who we nurture, who we love and who we protect. A man, from a man's perspective, if there is a woman who we want to take care of us, that's called a mother. And so you have a lot of situations where the husband's just content to stay at home. That wife is not really a wife to him. He's just looking for another mother to take care of him and clean up after him. And you don't want to have to be some man's second mother. You want a man who's actually going to be the husband and the leader and to take care of. And speaking of family, the next, so that's, those are the things that we can use so far to identify. He's saved. He knows the Bible. He pays the bills. And step four, he wants a family. Go to Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 18. And it talks about the importance of the family. Proverbs 5, 18. It says this, Let thy fountain be blessed. And for context here, it's, it, this is talking to a man, because in, in Proverbs 5, 1, it says, My son, attend to my wisdom and bow thy ear to my understanding. So this is talking to a man. And if you look at verse 18, it says, let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Rejoice with the wife of thy youth. The fact that a, a youth has a wife here means that what the Bible is teaching is get married early. All this talk of, well, wait until you're 30 and you're a millionaire, you know, and only then will you decide to get married. Before then, life is just about, you know, fornication and playing around and not being serious. If a young man is courting you and you bring up marriage and he immediately flinches or gets scared and says, well, I don't want to talk about marriage. I just want to take things. So what does the Bible say? Wife of thy youth. 
That's not taking things slow. That's actually getting married in your younger years. Now, that's not to mean that you just rush and marry someone off the street you just met, because obviously you have to put them through this test that the Bible's talking about here of all these qualifications of what a, a good husband is and a good man is, and you'd have to get to know a man for a significant amount of time in order to know if he has all these qualities. But the fact of the matter is, the Bible says to men, rejoice with the wife of thy youth. And if you have a wife of thy youth, that means you're getting married sooner rather than later. So it is not a godly attitude. It is not a godly spirit for a man to put off having a wife until he's 40 years old and he's done all the partying he can do. The Bible says, wife of thy youth. If a man wants to get married sooner rather than later, then that is one sign that he may be a real biblical man. Now, the next thing also has to do with wanting a family. Go to Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. Now, I once had a sign behind me that said, keeping our faith alive. It had this excerpt of Psalm 127 on it, but unfortunately it fell down. Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5 say this, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. So what we see here is that the Bible's describing having children as a reward from God. It describes them as arrows in the hand of a mighty man. And so that's what it says children of the youth are. Happy is the man that hath this quiver full of them. So this attitude today that we live in that says you need to not have children, you need to put off having children until you're 50, and only then only have one child and then get a dog, like as if a dog's a child. Dogs are not even people. But the point is, this attitude that says don't have any children, just get a dog instead, that is an anti-Christian attitude. That is a lie from the pit of hell, and that is not the right kind of attitude. People like to say, oh, well, the world's overpopulated. Well, if, if the world really was going to be overpopulated, God, his infinite knowledge, would not have given us the command to be fruitful and multiply. But be fruitful and multiply was not a suggestion. It was a commandment. Clearly, God knows what he's doing. But you do have lots of nations where lots of youth are in poverty, such as in the Middle East or in Africa or parts of Asia. But that poverty is due to the wickedness of evil men. That has nothing to do with the fact that those children existed. But here it says children are a heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward as arrows in the hand of a mighty man so are children of the youth. So you see how in the book of Proverbs it said wife of the youth. Now here it has children of the youth. You put them together, a real biblical man, a mighty man, as described here in verse four, is a man with a wife of his youth a, and children of his youth. You, you want family early if you're a real biblical man. And ladies, if you're looking for a real biblical man, or rather, if you're trying if you're trying to discern if a man who's looking for you is a real biblical man, if he wants a wife and kids, if talking about family does not scare him, you just might have found a real biblical man. But if the subject of family, the subject of marriage and the subject of children scares him and makes him feel intimidated because he just wants to be selfish, that kind of man does not want a family with you. That kind of man just wants to use you for your body and have physical pleasure with you, but does not want to actually commit to the responsibility of what happens after you get in bed with someone, the children that come out and, the, and, and all the responsibility of that. So if he does not want a family, he is not an eligible biblical man because the Bible says children of the youth and it says wife of the youth. And so that is what we as men ought to strive for, is being biblical and ignore this culture that says don't have kids until you're 40 because you don't want to have kids. Because my little girl, I have a daughter, she is a lot of fun. She is a blessing. And no, it has not always been easy because, again, we do live in a tough economy. But I have learned a lot about God through my interactions with my child and actually seeing how some of the scriptures come to play and how I can actually live out these scriptures of being a father and grow closer to God's word. My child was a blessing to me, and I love that little girl that I have. And if you're a young Christian man, having a family is not something to be afraid of. 
as long as you're paying the bills, as long as you're biblically responsible. Now, if you don't want to have a job and you just want to lay around, then I could see how this would be something that you would see as a problem. But children are a blessing, and a man who's scared of them is not a real biblical man. So, so far, it, a real biblical man is saved. He knows his Bible. He pays the bills, and he wants a family. The fifth thing is that he's a brave leader. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 through 14, we see Paul encouraging believers. And look at what he says. He says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. Let all things be done with charity. So you see here it says, quit you like men. Now the word quit there does not mean quit in what it means in today's terms. When we say quit here in today's world, quit means to give up and to walk away. But back in older English, the word quit meant to stay and fight. It meant the opposite of what it means today. The reason we know that is because the context. Look at verse 13. It says, watch ye stand fast. To stand fast means to keep going, to persevere, to not give up. So that's what this verse is talking about. So the word quit there does not mean to give up. Watch ye stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, and be strong. So clearly, to quit like a man means to be strong. It means to stand fast. Men don't give up easily. Men are ambitious. Men will fight. Men will fight to protect their families. Men will stand for the truth of the Bible because it says stand fast in the faith. But also let all things be done with charity, verse 14. A man is also willing to give to those who have need, but he's also willing to be loving. But you see here, a man is strong and he's tough and he stands fast. He does not back down. But you have a lot of men today who are unfortunately compromisers when it comes to the word of God. If an unbeliever gets up in their face, they'll, you know, fold and say, well, you know, even though that's what the Bible says, you don't have to believe it. I just, you know, I just want to be loving. I just want everyone to get along. And unfortunately, you have a lot of pastors who are even like that. If a, if a non-believer comes in their face, they will say, well, maybe it's true. Maybe it's just a metaphor. They won't actually stand for what the Bible teaches. But the Bible says, quit you like men. So ladies, if he's soft and a fraidy cat, he's not a real biblical man. Biblical men are strong and firm and will stand up for the God, for the God of the Bible, will stand up for the word and will stand up for their families. They will stand fast in the word of God. Not only that, but they are also willing to be a leader in their family. They're also willing to lead. They're strong and they're willing to take charge. Look at Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the savior for, of the body. So here, the husband is the head. The husband is the leader. The husband is the protector. Because if you go down to verse 25, <clears throat> Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So Jesus sacrificed himself. He gave himself so that we could be cleansed for our sins. Jesus was protecting us spiritually. But the picture being painted here is that that's the kind of sacrifice the husband needs to be willing to make for his wife. And so, you know, if there is a physically violent situation, we as husbands need to stand up to be the protector. If there is a spiritually violent situation where a non-believer is, you know, trying to bring false doctrine in, we need to stand up as husbands and be the spiritual protector. Look at verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So just as Christ gave himself up for his church, just as Christ sanctifies the church with his word, they said the washing of water by the word, so need husbands to protect their families both physically and spiritually. And so young ladies, if a young man is courting you, and when it comes to controversial issues where people mock the Bible and make fun of the Bible, if you find him caving, if you find him compromising, if you find him wussing out just because he wants everyone to get along, then he's not quitting like a man and being strong. He's not standing fast in the word and he's not being a head. He's not being a leader like what Ephesians chapter five teaches. He's not eligible. He's not ready for marriage. And young men, 
we need to learn that we can't be scared of anything. We have to be strong like men. And we have to, if we're married, we need to be the head of the wife and sanctify our wives with the word and be willing to give ourselves up for our wives. And so that is the fifth way to identify a, a good biblical man, a real biblical man. He's a brave, spiritual, and physical leader. Now, the next thing can be found, the next qualification of a husband can be found simply in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, and that is that he's tender with his wife. Look at 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And that's very important. Dwell with your wife according to knowledge. Do you know your wife? Are you knowledgeable on your wife? Do you, are you a good listener? Are you willing to be compassionate? Are you willing to give honor to her as the weaker vessel? Are you willing to be compassionate with her and realize that she needs your protection and she needs your guidance and reassurance rather than just being totally neglectful, totally selfish? You see the husband being pictured here that's dwelling with his wife according to knowledge, that's giving honor to his wife, that's being an heir together with the grace of life, that is a man who is responsive to his wife. He's tender to his wife. He's gentle. He's selfless. And so a real biblical man is a selfless man. And notice there is a consequence if a man's not selfless, if a man is being selfish and is mistreating his wife. God's not going to respond to his prayer. Look at this, that your prayers be not hindered. You know, if, you, if, if a man doesn't treat his wife right, God's not going to accept that man. God's not going to give that man all the blessings that he, he wants or needs. God's not going to, you know, just overlook that. God's going to punish that man until that man gets in line and treats his wife correctly, because if not, his prayers are going to be hindered. So that's something that we need to understand is that as men, we need to be tender and nurture and love our wives, even as Christ loved the church. So young ladies, if the man is courting you, and he's not a good listener, he's very selfish, he's very inconsiderate. You could probably even tell it in his body language or whether or not he holds the door for you, whether or not whenever you have a problem, he's willing to listen. If he doesn't do these things, then he's probably not ready to marry you. He's not a real biblical man because he's not going to dwell with you according to knowledge and his prayers will be hindered. And so we need to look at the serious things. And young men, we need to learn how to be good listeners. We need to be good leaders, yes, but we need to be good listeners also so we can respond to the needs of our wives when you all you know, go to get married. And so that's very important. He's selfless and he's a good listener and he's tender and compassionate. Now the final qualification that you can know to identify a man who's going to be a worthy husband, who's gonna be a good husband, is found in Hebrews 13, four. Hebrews chapter 13, verse four says this, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. And so what we need to understand from that is that a real biblical man is a one-woman man. Because a whoremonger is describing a man who just goes from this woman to that woman to that woman, and an adulterer is describing a man who, even though he's married, he's still going from this woman to that woman to that woman. And God will judge that man. And ladies, if a young man is considering marrying you and you know that he is wild and loose and that he's just, you know, all up under every other woman under the sun, you might have a whoremonger on your hands and you don't want to be married to someone who God's going to judge because that's going to cause strife and difficulty in your family. Again, going back to the mixed marriages in Deuteronomy chapter 7, where that brings the wrath of God. And so you don't want to be mixed up in that. You need to find, you need to let a man find you who is faithful, who is faithful to God's word. Because the Bible says the husband that find a man that findeth a good, a good wife findeth a good thing. And so if a man that findeth a wife findeth a good thing, that means the man goes out and finds the wife, not the other way around. So a real man, again, going back to the point about quit you like men and be strong, the real man makes the first move and finds the wife himself. If you have to make the first move, he's too much of a wimp. He's not ready being honest with you. Now, how can you tell if he's a whoremonger or not? How could you possibly know that? Well, one of the good ways to tell the character of a man is by the company he keeps. There's a figure of speech for that, but I'm not going to get into that. I'm just going to get to what the Bible says. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, it says this, 
He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So what we see there is that if he's walking with the wise, he's going to grow wise. But if he's a companion of fools, God's going to destroy him. So what we need to understand is one of the ways you can tell the character of a man, tell the kind if he has some of these qualifications, is if that man has good company. If he keeps friends that are saved, friends that are believers. If a man has a, a friends that are just a whole bunch of different religions, friends that are have in all kinds of sick stuff, if a man has friends like that, then you know he's a companion of fools and he's going to be destroyed. He's not a worthy husband for you. He's not a real biblical man. Young men, if you want to grow wise, find other Bible believers like yourself. Find a church and not just like, you know, on the Internet, like an actual physical church, because the Bible says to assemble together in the book of Hebrews. Young men, if you want to, you know, grow in the word of God, find like minded, biblical, Bible believing men that you can grow with where iron can sharpen iron that you can grow more about grow more in the word together because he that walks with the wise grows wise but if you have friends of a whole bunch of different religions and you're just compromising here and there because you want to keep their company you're being a companion of fools and god may bring destruction in your life and you don't want that so you need to turn away from that so those are some of the ways we can tell if a man is a real biblical man and young men this is how you can tell if you're meeting god's measuring stick for manhood Number one, a real biblical man is saved because if he's not saved, don't even bother marrying him. Mixed religion marriages are offensive in God's eyes. Number two, a real man knows the Bible because he has to teach his family. Number three, a real man pays the bills and doesn't just sit on his butt and let his wife do it. Number four, a real man actually wants a family because the Bible talks about children and wife of thy youth. Number five, a real man is strong and is a brave leader. Number six, a real man is tender and compassionate and is a good listener. And number seven, a real man is faithful to his wife. He's not a whoremonger. He's a one woman man and he keeps good friends because he doesn't want to suffer destruction. This is how you can identify a real biblical man. So young ladies, I pray that God may bring good husbands into your life so you can have strong biblical families and young men. Quit you like men and be strong. Let's be strong for God. Let's be strong men after God's own heart. God bless.